Welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Miller. Every week, I chat with fascinating people from all walks of life in order to bring you knowledge, inspiration, and insight. If you enjoy the show, you can support it by subscribing, leaving a review, and sharing it with a friend. This is the Jeremy Miller Podcast. Bryce Brenton. J. Mill, what Frank's up? Frank's Butcher Shop, baby. Oh, Live yeah. and in the flesh, dude. Welcome. I'm so glad to be here. We're in the, uh, what would you call this space? Uh, so the, up here we call this the bowl room, baby. The bowl yeah. room, I like that. Yeah, because we got the big bowl yeah. right there. Like the, basically the upstairs of the actual butcher shop. Yeah, here yeah, in Casper. yeah our Casper location for sure. I love yeah. that. Dude, um, Frank's Butcher Shop, for people that don't know what Frank's Butcher Shop is, they might have heard it from me on Instagram sure. saying how good it is, but <laughs> let's hear it from you. What is Frank's Butcher Shop? Ah, uh, that's a lot of things, man. Um, so let's talk about the meat side of things yeah. for sure. So, uh, what Frank's is, so we'll start just from the beginning. So Frank is actually my grandfather. Uh, it's named after him and like his legacy and everything like that. <clears throat> but, uh, I didn't ever get the pleasure to meet that guy. He died uh, oh, way before I could really remember memories or anything like that. So that's a little unfortunate, but, uh, yeah, so it's named after him. Uh, so what we do is uh, uh, my family has this ranch uh, outside of Glenrock uh, in Wyoming, and we raise cattle up there, and then we uh, ship them off to our USDA processing facility, also in Wyoming, and uh, process and dispatch and cut up the animals there. And then we all, uh, send it to our retail stores and sell the meat so it's like a whole ranch to table farm to table experience for uh all the meat and then uh we have the two locations physical locations we have one here in casper and then we have one in hudson wyoming and then the casper one's got a pretty kick-ass bar and grill and then of course this little banquet room that we got so kind of a little bit of everything in the butcher shop Heck yeah. yeah and you guys do online sales right oh yeah yeah so uh that's like a division as you may know because uh You've been blasting that. Thanks. Shout out. Uh, you've, uh, yeah, we just launched our online division uh, recently. And so we've been, uh, since we're USDA, we're allowed to ship all over the nation and everything nice. like that. And so we're just trying to educate people on the uh, awesome taste of Frank's, baby. Dude, yeah. I'm not lying when I say this. It is, it's truly like the best beef best steaks ever like that I've ever had. Yeah. Down. I mean, there's a, there's a lot that goes into that to make it that case. So, uh, I mean, yeah, we're, uh, you want me to get into that? And talk? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean like what, what makes Frank so good? Like, why is it different from yeah. anything? I mean, cause I used to use like butcher box mm -hmm. and I think it comes from like New Zealand. It's like, like farm raised, like I think they have some elk and cows and stuff, but it's all like very, I think it's kind of industrial, even though it's yeah. grass fed and stuff, but it's, it has like a weird taste to it. It just doesn't seem high quality, especially after having Frank's, Sure, but Frank's like, it's just like, I don't think it gets more high quality i feel like well yeah i mean that has to do with this thing called wet aging so uh mm. let's talk about aging and the term that term for a yeah. sec so like what wet aging is is a term that the uh like conglomerates of the meat industry invented uh so what they're saying is that in the package so when you seal the meat and put it in a vacuum tight package like butcher box or a large producer of that kind uh it is aging and um so what it does is it's manipulating like the decomposing uh, process mm. to where the enzymes and the proteins naturally break down, adding some tenderness. So that does happen and all that. But when it's in an anaerobic environment like that, uh, what happens is it uh, produces a flavor profile that is completely different than what you uh, from the term dry aging. And so a lot of people call it like metallic or even kind of penny like. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's kind of what that is. So the reason why we're different is because we dry age everything too. So we dry age at least 14 days. Uh, so that meaning we just hang it on the hook in open air. Uh, we have these fancy like ozone machines is what they're called. So they emit O3 into the room to help, uh, you know, make sure there's no negative bacteria or anything that grows on the uh, hanging slabs of meat yeah. and stuff. And so that really develops a flavor profile that is unlike anything there ever is. So that's why uh, I don't know if you've seen, like follow any chefs on Instagram or anything like that. They're always constantly cooking these crazy 60 day, 90 day dry edge steaks and stuff. And so mm. that is good, but not a lot of people like that. So what we do is the 14 days and, uh, yeah. And it just, that's a solid, uh, 
to for the masses yeah uh, like it because when you get to that 60 days it gets a little funky for some people yeah. i personally really like it but a lot, a lot of people like for example malaya my wife she does not like that at all yeah so <laughs> You know, uh, yeah, so that's really what, like, flavor profile. And on top of that, we have an awesome uh, group of, like, local growers and everything that we use. So, I mean, it's just like a garden, right? Like, I don't know if you garden at all or anything like that. But uh, we, uh, if you have a tomato from your garden, it tastes way better than the tomato that it is uh, oh, yeah. from the grocery store, right? Uh, just because all uh, you're not putting a bunch of herbicides and all these different things on it. It's not mass produced and all that stuff. And so we're small enough to where uh, it's more of like a boutique and the way that we can raise cattle and yeah. comparatively to our competitors for sure. Yeah. All that. That's one thing I'm curious about is like you guys are growing the online side plus you have all the in-person retail right here. How do you like keep that small like family owned cattle ranch able to produce like if you guys just start blowing up and you have like mm -hmm. thousands of orders or whatever like how do you keep up with well, that and it, maintain that it's a dance for sure so it's like uh, a dance between the cattle the processing and then this uh retail side of things and so uh yeah dude it's it's it gets hard so we have to like plan for growth very accordingly right and so and thankfully right well not necessarily thankfully like this is the best time uh the last four years have been some of the best time for ranchers in general just the way cattle prices are right now they are astronomically high so from the time we've started they've literally doubled in value yeah oh my yeah in the last four years so it's great great for ranching uh not great when you're trying to buy cattle but uh so what we do is we piece together uh all these different ranches from uh across wyoming so for example like we can't do a uh we can't just do it solely on ourselves because you need different calving cycles um, in order to um, produce all year long. You know, we we process anywhere from like 10 to 24 head a week, depending Jeez. on uh, on the time of year, of course. And so then, uh, you know, we can't we got to piece that all together somehow. We can't necessarily sustain that all year round because they need to be at an optimal weight for their yield grades and everything like that. So. Yeah, like I said, it's a dance for sure. Um, yeah. yeah, and so we source from, we use a lot of our neighbors uh, up by our ranch, and then we outsource outside of Lander and all these beautiful mountainous areas and stuff like that, so. Yeah, because, I mean, it's like, like you said, you have to plan for the, the like, what do you call it, the calving cycle, basically? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, because it, it takes anywhere from about uh, 16 to 18 months for a steer to come to mature, maturity. Uh, so you're planning, like, almost two years ahead essentially and hoping that you have enough cattle for like to match the growth yeah essentially but we also don't necessarily uh depending on the time of year and depending mm. on, on our different strategies and stuff uh we buy a lot of different weights too so uh we don't necessarily put them into the system all the time until they're like maybe 500 pounds okay. or like 900 pounds or whatever the case and then we can uh finish them off because our target weight's about 1400 that makes sense yeah dang um one how many cattle so you said you guys do 10 to 24 head a week slaughtering. Mm -hmm. And then like how many cattle do you guys have on your ranch out, out by Glen Rock? Uh, it, it's probably always changing, but yeah, it, it, quite a few. Uh, so it just kind of depends. Uh, so what we have up at the ranch is that's where all of our Wagyu is based out of. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we uh, are actually launching a line soon that they're not mature quite yet, but we are doing these full blood Wagyu's that, and that's the home base at the ranch. And so nice. we uh, have invested quite a bit of money in some like awesome steers and some or some awesome bulls and some awesome embryos. And we've AI'd these uh, full blood Wagyu that we're going to have. Whoa. So they're going to be ready uh, in the spring, Dang. I believe. Yeah. So that'll be that'll be way awesome. And does Wagyu, you've explained this to me several times, but I did never remember. Uh, there's Kobe beef and Wagyu. Kobe beef you can only get like in Japan, like true Kobe beef, right? Yeah. So, so it is what, so Wagyu, uh, for those that don't know, is just a, uh, breed of cattle. So it has higher marbling in it. Um, and it has a different flavor profile. Uh, a lot of people get into the omega threes on it too. Mm. Uh, that's kind of like a popular thing with all that, but yeah, the Kobe beef is specifically from the Kobe region of Japan. So when you look at these beef, it, they are like the fat inside. It is 50, 50 practically, oh, or even more like it is insane. The way that these steaks look, the like marbling inside of them. So the flavor of them is way high because essentially fat is flavor. 
Okay, so on everything. So you guys have true like hundred percent wagyu. Or, yeah, so or you're about to. Uh, yeah, exactly. So they're uh, Japanese lineage. Uh, so that's kind of the, there's like three main wagyu types. There's the Japan. There's Japanese. There's Australia. And then there's American. Americans like becoming a, a lot more popular, like Snake River Farms, for example. Oh, yeah. um, they do a lot of Wagyu and they're out of Idaho. So they, uh, uh, you, you're starting to see uh, the prevalence of like American Wagyu really taking over the market, specifically when you go to like fancy restaurants and things yeah. like that. So that's kind of the goal because I think that's kind of where our product is, is getting it into these like nicer restaurants and things like that. Yeah. Really making it more Was that, of like a. That stuff that you made when we had the barbecue a few weeks ago mm -hmm. that was wagyu was that from your guys's yeah so th uh that's not like these ones so with those ones were were uh f2 crosses meaning just fancy for 75 percent okay uh, Dude, even that was like yeah and oh it, my it's gosh. Nuts. it's so yeah, good it's so tasty like you can uh just basically cut it with a fork you don't even need a Dang. knife or anything and just the flavor profile alone yeah it's just so tasty yeah Dude. so we're doing these full bloods making up uh trying to grow a herd a little bit on that and then uh yeah start selling those bad nice. boys too will you be able to sell the uh the wagyu online just like all the other stuff too? oh yeah oh, oh nice. yeah yeah so we're gonna we're gonna try to get that going but uh like and said, when will that be uh hopefully around the spring we kind of got a uh so the reason so wagyu is more expensive right it's not necessarily more expensive because it is a better product. I, a little bit goes into that. It's more expensive because they take longer to produce. So going back to our regular stuff, like it's 16, 18 months for the uh, regular steers. Mm. But for the Wagyu, it's, we try to hit them right under 30, like 29 months. So because they take almost double the amount of time to oh, wow. uh, do all that stuff. So um, that's why when you see Wagyu and everything, it's always so like pretty comparatively to the regular beef yeah. uh, like practically double because it's double the amount of time you got to put into them yeah that makes sense that's a good segue into like all the uh, the marketing stuff oh yeah <laughs> in the beef industry yeah dude that is a wild <laughs> wild topic i feel like uh, a lot of people would be interested in this stuff uh and i i've tried to learn about it and it's just like there's so many buzzwords and terms oh, and so it's like many. what does it even mean like even this morning i was like just doing some like research and stuff and like all the Walmart meat says all natural. Mm -hmm. Like what, what okay. does that even so, mean? <laughs> uh, so yeah, let's start with all natural. So all natural, basically what that means is there's no hormones. Okay. Um, they have, uh, you can still be vaccinated under all natural, but you cannot be having any antibiotics. So if okay. that steer gets sick or something like that, that has to be cut out of the herd and uh, not because it's got to get given antibiotics. You don't just let it die, yeah. right? Like, and then uh, so that one cannot be categorized as all natural. So antibiotics is in that and hormones. So they can't be on any sort of uh, growth hormone or because that that's like a popular thing for. Say I'm a cattle rancher and I have a crop um, of calves that I'm trying to sell, but. 500 weights are better than 300 weights mm -hmm. for market price. So this year, what we're going to do is implant them with hormones oh, and geez. get them to the 500 weight. And so I make more money doing that. And so that's, that's kind of the industry in that. And uh, I feel like you've been seeing a lot in the industry, like that's not the case anymore, that everyone's trying to sort of get away from that to an extent, just because the market's not really wanting that. Right. Yeah. yeah like I personally don't, we don't, we're all natural. So we do everything all natural for all of our beef. So we don't have any sort of a growth hormone or um, antibiotics or anything like that. Is uh, It might be different from the poultry industry, but I I know in chicken, like you can't, like you literally can't sell chicken unless it's, uh, like you can't sell chicken if it has hormones or antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So then it's like when they put on no antibiotics, no hormones, it's like, it's just, it doesn't really mean anything because you couldn't yeah. sell it anyways. Yeah. So Is it the same for beef? Yeah. Uh, yes and no. So, uh, uh, so you see that more in the grade. So let's 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 go back. Like, so we're a USDA processing facility. So what that means is we are the gold standard for health and safety. The way uh, in which our labels are created, the way we have to uh, advertise our products and all that stuff, because we have a USDA inspector in our processing facility watching what we do all day long. Mm. Uh, so we cannot actually operate without that guy uh, kind of watching, cutting us, uh, dispatching the animals, all the things. So uh, with that comes higher level of um, uh, sort of regulation, essentially, right? Because 
obviously we have an inspector there all the time watching what we're doing. So that's huge. Uh, that, that USDA mark allows us to sell beef uh, and all the, all the uh, products that we sell across state lines. So a lot of people are state inspected, and so they would be only allowed to sell in, in their state that they – and so that's kind of a big difference on everything too. So, um, so because we're USDA, we have to follow the USDA guidelines for uh, labeling and mm. terms and all that stuff. So uh, a popular one you've seen is probably grass-fed. Oh, yeah. You see it everywhere now. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so grass-fed is bonkers. Like it can be called 100% grass-fed. But that animal, if it was on grass for 50% of its life or longer, can be called 100% grass fed. What? Yeah, it's so insane. That like, doesn't uh, makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so. Um, what? Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, who came up with that? <laughs> well, exactly. So, like, and we what? can get into that later. But yeah, the meat industry, the way things have developed over the course of time, just is so corrupt and so insane. And it blows my mind. But. Um, wow. But yeah, so that goes into it. Uh, it is one of the only products that doesn't have to have its origin on it. So you can. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So like you uh, hardly ever see where it's from or anything like that, uh, unless it's processed in the United States, then you're allowed to. Yeah. But if it's imported, it doesn't necessarily have to say product of Canada went on to the consumer package mm. or anything like that or product. I know where there's a breeze always talking about like avocado oil. Mm -hmm. uh, like the, if you're trying to find like the best avocado oil, it should be like single origin, like from Mexico or Spain or something. Mm -hmm. But like if you go to Walmart, look on the shelf or like any grocery store, it's like product of like eight countries and it's just like all this random crap like piled together. Do people do that with beef too? Or oh, hundred percent. Like, like when you go to the grocery, so let's talk about mass producing and feeding America essentially. Yeah. Right. So like, um, when you feed America, they, uh, so for, just on the other side of the border in Colorado, there's this huge processing facility. Okay. They process around upwards of 60,000 head a week. Holy there. Shit. So when they are turning them into burger, right. The, it's a product of 60,000 heads. So like there's been a bunch of studies out there that they, they sample the DNA of like a ground beef from the grocery store and there could pop, there could be who knows how many uh, different animals within that. Oh my god! Yeah. Gosh. That one package of ground beef that you're eating. So I don't know. I think you lose a little bit of quality in my opinion. When yeah. you do that. Uh, and so, um, yeah. And so that's just kind of wild. The whole beef industry as a whole. And so that's why I really feel like that we make such a difference on everything. Yeah. So we're just kind of, we're, we're big enough to where we can produce stuff, but we're small enough to do things like the appropriate and correct way on yeah. how it needs to be done. It's, it's, it's got to be like a fine line of like, I, you don't want to get too big almost because then, I mean, there's got to be a way I would imagine to maintain the quality and be able to. Oh, for sure. And so, we, yeah, I mean, uh, it's just growing pains for everything, yeah. right? Like, so we, uh, we're doing, I think we're on a good pace right now. Yeah. Uh, kind of what we're doing. We maintain the two stores fairly. Okay. And then we also do the online fairly. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, we're, uh, I mean, it, it's working. So, yeah. uh, yeah, it's just planning for growth is a little bit tough. So the main rate, like essentially our competition and everything like that, uh, not even really our competition. I don't really consider other ranchers or other people like what we're doing competition because I think it's a positive thing for yeah. the industry. It's way better getting uh, some beef from a local rancher or something like that comparatively to going to Sam's Club or any of the you know mass chains or anything like that. So I don't necessarily see this competition because there's plenty to go around. But uh, where I see we own our processing facility. So that is a huge advantage for us. So for example, if you weren't doing that, the business model would be you produce all these cattle and now you're hoping that your uh, the processing facility, you have scheduled slots for them. Mm -hmm. And now you have to manage their in the inventory and go and pick it up. And it just adds a couple more layers to that. So, which helps control our pricing a little bit because we control that whole process right there. So, yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to like the grass fed mm -hmm. stuff uh, because it's just everywhere. 
<laughs> so 100% grass fed could be 50% of its life. Yeah. Is only only 50% is grass yeah, fed. And not necessarily even on grass that grows from the ground, grass that is fed to them in like a feedlot or something like that too. Yeah. So, cause that's, I'm guessing that's different from like pasture raised. Yeah. So pasture raised sounds exactly what that would be. Uh, it's in the pasture raised. So then if you really want grass, uh, 100% grass fed products, what you need to be looking for is grass fed and finished. Uh, when it says that on the label, what that means is through the finishing period of the animal's growing time, uh, it was given grass of some sorts, whether it's from the ground, from a silage of some kind. And depending on the blends of all that, that's what you're trying to look for. And that's the stuff that really, like, for example, like the fitness community, as you may know, really digs the grass finish stuff. Yeah. Uh, and that has a lot to do with like the carotenes in the grass and the way that it metabolizes and the fat and all that stuff. So when you look at grass finished products, um, they are a lot more yellow looking. So, uh, or even like wild game, for example, like it, people are more familiar with like bison and things like that. You can buy that at the grocery store. So typically all those are hundred percent grass fed and finished. And so the way the, uh, the carotenes metabolize in the fat will tint it yellow comparatively to a grain finished product will, uh, tint it more of like a white color. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah Cause I mean, and I'm guessing a cow like naturally doesn't want to eat a bunch of grain and like shit. It's like, it's naturally going to go out in a pasture and eat grass sure it's like the more uh, organic natural thing for it to do i yeah i wouldn't necessarily say it's more natural than another thing uh because i really am pro grain too um really? yeah uh i think gra it depends on your intention just like anything right like so uh when you have a grain finished beef for example when you eat a wagyu let's talk about that when you eat wagyu and that experience that you're trying to do with a wagyu is way different than when you have a grass fed and finished ribeye right? The things aren't the same. It's a different product altogether. And so we do, we do both. Uh, we do grain finished and, uh, grass finish. Mm. And, we, uh, another thing with like the grain finish, I think it gets a bad rap that it's like just feeding them, uh, just corn dumped in thing. Yeah. That's, that's not necessarily the case. Like it is a silage blend, meaning, um, we take hay, you ferment it. Um, so it's easier for the animal to break down and everything like that from these natural, uh, uh, from like a cutting of hay or alfalfa or something like that, incorporate your grain supply, whether it's, uh, it, it could be a wide array of whatever materials are around. So <clears throat> like distillers grains are popular, like byproducts from brewing beer and brewing alcohol and things like that. Uh, incorporating that to essentially give them a higher protein and a higher caloric intake on that uh is really what makes the grain finish and it, it, it does get a bad rap for uh in my opinion i'm not actually why, sure why Interesting. Uh, uh but i do see i think it has to do with because people think that grass finished is so much a uh, healthier product that the grain finish can't be a healthier product now i don't necessarily think that that's the case i think it would be uh just the grass finished is a better product for what you're trying to achieve you know yeah so maybe it's more of a would be like more of a nutrient thing then like the yeah you know, just yeah higher quality like vitamins and minerals or something like that yeah and i think it just has to do with the association of a feedlot as well oh, okay. you know um and then also uh hot words like monocrop agriculture and things like that so when all these kind of negative associated things in uh the culture right now are um, and I'm not saying that those are great things by any yeah. means, but, uh, it's just hot words, right. That are, and then you take an association of the one thing into the other. And then that's kind of where, uh, it turns into a negative a aspect. Okay. And yeah, of course, like, um, I mean, yeah, like people can't digest grain as well. Um, and the cattle, I think, I mean, according to what those steaks look like and how they're metabolizing fat and our yeah. ribeyes, uh, fat's your friend, fat's flavor, yeah. uh, even in the grass finished fat is flavor and like the Wagyu. So, uh, the reason why Wagyu is popular too, is like I was talking about the omega threes. So going back to the meat industry and like the hole in the hot words and stuff yeah. like that. So omega threes are popular in salmon, right? That's why people eat them. So uh, I can't remember the actual number, but a Wagyu omega-3 comparatively to a normal beef omega-3 is like 300 times more. Oh, whoa. But that omega-3 for your daily caloric in, or daily uh, need comparatively to a salmon is like 2,000 times less than what you actually need. So oh, whoa. That, that just goes to show it's the way that the meat industry is marketing everything in order to, you know, sell it essentially. Like, but... Um, 
And so it's just like anything. I think intention behind why you're buying a product is way more important than uh, comparing what you're trying uh, yeah. one to another. I think I think that's a better way to say that because the fa- grain finish is flavor and. Yeah when you're cooking and it's delicious grass finish isn't going to taste the same. And it's, um, and it serves more of a purpose on like health and things like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah it seems, so it seems like, I mean, the biggest factor is just like, where's the meat coming from? hundred percent. More than yeah. like what it's actually consuming. Yeah. Like to me, that's, that's a huge thing. It's like, uh, how's the animal living its life? Yeah. You know, is it outside? You know, it doesn't have basic, uh, needs of water. And so like even, uh, uh, even feedlots, for example, they get a bad rap. And, uh, how do you describe a feedlot? So the feedlot, let's describe the feedlots that I use. Uh, cause we, uh, finish in feedlots. We live in Wyoming. We do not have the capability of letting the, uh, animals graze all year round. So we have to put them in feedlots. So feedlots, in my opinion, are, the ones that we have are huge. Uh, they're these uh, big pins, essentially, and there is a trough that they put whatever blend of silage into the the truck, and it blends it up and shoots it out in a uh, in a trough, and for them to feed. So it's not like the steers are going and just uh, like forcing them to eat it they just eat it and then yeah. uh a lot of our pins specifically in our wheatland location have a they it's a field too so it's that lots where the feed trough is but then they can open it up into a field mm-hmm. um gets a little dicier when the snow's way way um way more thick right yeah <clears throat> especially in wheatland it gets crazy there but uh yeah and then so we keep anywhere from like anywhere from like 30 to 60 per pin and then, yeah, we just takes it, it takes an army in order. To, a lot of people are kind of, uh, in my opinion, don't quite understand where their food comes from. Yeah. And I think that's like the main thing that we're talking about, right? And like the main problem in, with intentionality is you just need to know where your food comes from. Uh, I feel like that is uh, people are so far removed from that that uh, is kind of essentially associating some of these uh, negative connotations for some some of these things like we we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It's so sad. Like you go to the grocery store and we're so separated from like you buy a pack of ground beef and it probably came from like a giant processing plant with 60,000 cattle a week. And it could be a cow from California and a cow from Virginia. And it's like, who who the hell knows where it comes from Yeah, yeah. and how it was processed. And it's just like all this mass produced stuff. That's like, just mass feeding people basically. And yeah. I mean, it's, we're just so like disconnected from yeah, the, the mean, origin of the food. I mean, we get in a lot of problems with America. Right. But like <laughs> that's, that's one is it's making, uh, the system is, uh, essentially there to cause, have a purpose. And unfortunately, just like any other industry in the United States, there's like five major conglomerates that control the whole process. So, yeah. um, yeah. And like, so it, that's the reason why it is the way it is, you know? And so it's people, you know, like your local ranchers who are trying to sell half beef and like Frank's butcher shop and all these other producers that do the same similar things that us really are trying to take a stand because it, it makes for a way better uh, product for one. And for two, it is, that is the way better way and more sustainable way to do it comparatively to what's happening right now. Yeah. Yeah. I saw a stat, uh, it was, Thirty-two percent of all U.S. land is beef ranch land, and then another eight percent of all U.S. land is dedicated to like basically corn, which is then used for feed, specifically mm-hmm. for beef. So, forty percent of all the land in the U.S. is dedicated to like beef production, essentially. Yeah, which is insane. Yeah, uh, yeah, it takes a lot of land, man. Yeah, that's why Wyoming's so suited for it. Uh, there's more cattle here than people. So really, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's what, 600,000 people, in not a lot of people Wyoming. to outnumber. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that makes sense. Uh, they, uh, it's beef country, right? That's, yeah. uh, beef's what's for dinner. It's always like a popular thing around here because that's a large part of the economy. Uh, in a lot of places, like all of our neighboring States for sure. Almost every state, um, it has large beef beef production and just the way that uh, people care about beef. Yeah. It's interesting that it's 40%. So 
kind of going back to the whole conglomerate thing. So, uh, let me paint you a picture of kind of what's happened in the last like four years. So cattle prices are insane. Uh, so the five conglomerates are obviously the largest importers in, uh, and buyers in the United States. And so they kind of dictate what the price of cattle and everything's going to be. Um, so what they've been doing is increasing the price of cattle, um, by decreasing the supply of, to the re into the retail shop. So increasing the price. So, if I have a bunch of steers and I wasn't planning on selling them all, I'm going to sell them all because now the price is like some of the highest price it's ever been, right? So we're dumping it. And so in the United States, it's a very low right now for cattle production. So our inventory on the whole United States is super low, which ergo increases the price even more. Is that intentional? Yes. Interesting. Yeah. So it's happening to sweat people like us. Yeah. So what they're really? doing is, uh, oh, hundred percent. Yeah. So they, they are, uh, um, increasing the price of cattle to where they can import their, uh, some of their market share and get a 1% profit off of everything and be happy with that because they sell million, hundreds of millions of pounds of cattle all the, or of beef all over the United States. And so 1% to them is pretty good, yeah. uh, which makes my pricing, I can't necessarily be as competitive now. And so it, that, that, and that where it helps is we own the processing facility, we own the ranches, we own the retail stores. We kind of are, we own the whole supply chain of it to really where we can maintain our costs to be sort of competitive with, um, the large, chains right now yeah it's it, it's shit. it's pretty insane so yeah they're just trying to sweat people like us and your ranchers to make them stop doing it and make sure that they can't compete with what their Jeez. product is that in my opinion is a super inferior product at, anyway that's crazy it's all just money driven it profits. is yeah i mean it's just i mean look around dude that's the world you know yeah it's so sad to see it's but, so sad yeah i mean like for the I mean, nobody's benefiting from that other than the people that own those businesses. Like people are getting less quality food and meat. Mm -hmm. People like you or other people like the smaller people are struggling more like the smaller businesses. I'm sure a lot of people have probably gotten out of business, like small ranchers. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Damn. That yeah. Sucks. Yeah. No, it's, it's a, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's good for ranchers though. Like that is out of the all thing, it is great for ranchers okay. because it's large prices for ranchers. So that yeah. means uh, they're getting more money. So that's great. Uh, for the producer side of things, like people like us, not as great because okay. we got to buy those, right? And so, uh, but we are, we're still here. We're not going anywhere. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll fight uh, as long as we can for all that stuff. So, well, who are some of those big uh, competitors? You know, uh, like JBL is one of them, Tyson. Uh, oh, yeah, dude, yeah. Tyson. Yeah, Tyson's wild. Uh, yeah, but JBL is a large one. Uh, they're a primarily Brazilian-owned company, so they import a lot from South America mm. and things like that. And so, yeah, there's just there's they can and you see it. It's it's so crazy, man. When you go to like a sale barn, you can almost see them not bid against each other. Yeah, because there are certain producers that they use and sell to the same producers. And then even when those people like the head name company guy goes and buys them from like the feedlot and stuff. They're like, oh no, these ones are overweight. We're not going to buy these ones. Or these ones aren't quite there yet. Um, they need like another couple of weeks. They come back a couple of weeks later. Now they're overweight. We're discounting the price on it. Like they control the, they control it all. Like they're the, they're the producers. What are you going to do? Not sell your cattle to them, you oh know? And so, uh, that's where it's super important for like, just to cut that, per that, um, the processing is huge, like yeah. going back because they're, they own the major processing facilities. Like, um, and of course, just economically, uh, another reason why we're kind of a little different is we're in Wyoming, right? Uh, so the main ones are by those 9% of cornfields that you were talking about. So yeah. they're, they're in Iowa, they're in Nebraska, Colorado, uh, is where all the major processing facilities, there's one in Minnesota that's, uh, opening up supposed to be one of the largest one ever that is actually strictly rancher based um mm. so we'll see how that goes if it continues or not Interesting. But, yeah i saw another stat uh it was versus compared to 50 years ago we produce i just want to get your thoughts on this we produce 20 percent more beef but there's 15 percent less cattle than 50 years ago is it just because like they're like, like they figure out how to make the beef bigger, like per, oh, for like sure. per yeah. cattle head, like oh, they get more beef out of it. Have you ever, uh, so when you go to a bull sale, for example, um, what happens is you get a catalog in the catalog. 
it has um, specifically registered things. So register, uh, we can get into that later, but you get a catalog of everything that's in the sale. So within every bull, there's these things called P, uh, um, it's like the stats of mm, okay. that specific, uh, bull and its offspring or him or whatever the case may be. And so in there, there's ones that are ribeye area, carcass weight, birth weight, um, we care about, uh, IMF intermuscular fat, which is marbling, uh, ribeye size, um, all the different components, uh, the elevation cause elevation is a big one with brisket disease, all the, all these sort all these sorts of things, uh, related to that specific. And so that's kind of what you, um, judge what, how you want to buy your bulls for your herds and things like that. So specifically, let's talk about Angus, right? Everyone knows about black Angus and Angus and, uh, there's just more money in all that. There's a, the registered side of things is there's a lot of money in that. So the genetics have came a long way. Uh, and so that's why I think that is, is because looking at those charge charts, now they're specifically breeding their herds to exactly the needs of what they're, they're like, gosh, you know, I re have really good marbling, but I wish my ribeye area was a little higher. And so what they're going to do is incorporate genetics of these bulls um, that have higher ribeye area. And so now it's making these steers, you know, exactly what the, uh, intent, what, going back to intentionality, oh, right. Uh, exactly kind of what's needed for your herd and things yeah. like that. And so people have gotten a lot better at that, frankly. Interesting. Do you think that's a bad thing or it's just like, Oh no, I, I, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. It's a, I would argue, uh, it's actually a good thing because exactly we're getting a more yield on less product and now yeah. we instead of 40 percent of the country we can maybe even get that down because we're fee, uh, meeting the demands of the market and things yeah, like that that makes sense yeah because there's a whole deal i remember i think it was the the green new deal that whole like political bill a couple of years ago i think it was like aoc that was coming mm -hmm. out with it they're talking about like all the farting cows and all the yeah this the, shit like talking about methane yeah <laughs> yeah, dude, yeah. That is. so I don't know how much truth there actually is to that. I think there's some, but like, I mean, it makes sense. Like if you get a more efficient cow, like you get more meat out of each individual animal, mm -hmm. that makes sense. So yeah, it, uh, it's about yield yeah. like, and that's kind of, so once again, the processing facilities are owned by the major corporations. And so those people aren't going to just tell you about all the things that are entailed to the meat industry because they don't really want you to know about it. Right. And so that's why there's gag laws about what happens in processing facilities and all like you can't video or like photograph or anything that's like scary. that. Yeah. Isn't that wild? Like that's, and that's what people are eating. So anyway, uh, it's about yield. So it, that has a lot to do with the processing facility. So it has a lot to do with the animal and make sure the animal is at appropriate weights uh, within the range for the frame of the animal specifically. But uh, yeah, it's more about yield. So like how much are we going to actually get off of this steer in order to be profitable or not, like at the end of the day. So yeah, you, a general rule of thumb is you shoot for like 60 to 64%. So there is what's 100 minus 64 Uh 36 percent is actually either not necessarily wasted because yeah. i mean we do a lot of different things uh, a lot of them go to like dog food plants mm -hmm. um you sell hides and uh all the sorts we sell all the varieties uh so you're saying 64 percent of each animal gets utilized basically. yes okay. uh-huh yeah that's what you're shooting for yeah and so okay. like depending on if they're too uh um if they're like overweight then it can go down if they're mm -hmm. underweight it can go down uh, there's a lot of different variables that kind of go into that. Yeah. Yeah. One thing, uh, I guess I was reading about uh, was like a better or like an advantage to like a smaller, like family owned type of thing. Like Frank's is, uh, I guess more, probably more just the benefit of having like pasture raised cows versus like the giant, like factory farm type stuff is like, it's so much better for the soil because like the manure is like out in fields and, and like the grasslands are like being, eaten and consumed and everything in like a more natural way. Uh, and like, like, it just seems like all the, I mean, obviously the factory farming is just, it's terrible for the consumer. It's also terrible for the environment. Like, again, the, literally the only thing that only benefit from it is the, the people owning the companies. Like oh, these giant sure. Companies. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, even a lot of, uh, like there's natural cat. We like a lot of our producers are natural calvers, meaning they put, they separate their cows out after they have uh preg checked into a field and then they go and check on them three months later. 
and they separate the crop off uh, after weaning and that's how they designate so these these cattle are literally just in the pasture hanging out don't see people for three four months out of the year while they're naturally giving birth and everything like that hence going back to like uh, birth weights and why you pick your bulls the appropriate way and everything like that and then uh yeah the first time they're seeing um steers is time for sorting and uh you know and all the you know and uh, castration and whatever the case may be for all that stuff so so like when you when you're driving down like the interstate and you see like a bunch of cows just hanging out in a field are those typically uh used for like beef so there uh, production that's a good question so there's uh essentially for beef there's kind of three sort of operations that happen um one is uh, you have a cow calf operation. So what that means is you have a bunch of mamas, right? And you can buy bulls and stuff. You, what you're trying to do is get those mamas to produce a calf. And then you take the calf and from the calves, you can either grow your herd and uh, replacements and stuff like that from the older cows. And then also you sell off a lot of those other ones. And those ones, uh, depending if that those uh, mamas are registered, meaning uh, they're registered with the American Wagyu Association, if they're registered with um, Black Angus, all these Angus associations, any of the type, then those ones will be sorted off to make more bulls and things like that. And there's more money in selling the cows and the bulls with the registered stuff. And then the commercial side of things is where uh, you sell it to uh, feedlots, you sell it to producers, you sell it to growers, uh, all the different things in order to get... Uh, excuse me, in order to get all the, uh, the money that they need out of it. And so then there are stocker programs, uh, which are, you buy the, that crop, you grow them and then you sell them again. So you're kind of like just, uh, you're buying other people's stuff, you're growing it and then you sell it again. And then there is uh, strictly registered stuff. So registered stuff, registered herds, um, typically are just that's all they're doing is trying to produce bulls and things like that and sell, have these big bull sales and everything. And so typically if you're at that level, you have a commercial side and it bounces back and forth off of each other. So you okay. can, you use some of your bulls to, um, get all your commercial cows and everything like that, just an additional income. So that makes sense. yeah, there's a few different like models for ranching. So it kind of depends if they're, if they're mamas, uh, the mamas are not going to be, uh, essentially turn into beef mm. uh, cattle they're just there to really produce and give them a calf until maybe later on in their life or whatever the case may okay. be yeah dang yeah uh what about uh like the dairy side of things yeah man uh that's a because that's a whole other i know you're the you're the raw milk guy <laughs> dude uh yeah yeah like, yeah i'm not <laughs> as familiar with uh frankly that's just not as much around here right yeah. uh this is beef country for beef, not necessarily raw milk, you know? Yeah. And so like, uh, yeah, the dairy cows, that's not necessarily things that people, uh, really do around here too much. It's probably least, too cold maybe. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I, um, yeah, frankly, that is an industry I really can't even tell you about. Yeah. Uh, I <laughs> don't know that much about any of that. I would argue it's very similar in the sense of, uh, the way they have to manage their pastures and feedlots and things like that in order to get the cows right. in there and then constantly keeping those cows in milk production. I don't understand how that process works at all yeah, or anything like that. But yeah, I don't know a lot about it. I just do know that it's kind of the same thing of like, you have probably a f- handful of like big players who own everything. That's who's like producing all the milk for Walmart and whole foods and like all the like just mass produced stuff. And that's, not to get too conspiratorial, but like why they started pasteurizing milk and it, when you pasteurize milk, it just destroys so much <laughs> of the nutrients in it. Yeah. Don't get me started. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's, I think it all comes down to profits of like, okay, if we can get the milk to last longer, kill all the bacteria, basically you're just drinking this weird, like protein water stuff. And then it sits on the shelf longer so they can make more money from it. But also you, I mean, there is the slight chance of like a, a disease or illness or something in the milk, but like, you can get that from salad at the store yeah. just as much or if not more. Uh, so I guess it does reduce the chances of that, but like you probably don't want to be drinking mass produced raw milk. Like you want to find it from a place comparable to like Frank's of like a local farm. That's like takes good care of their stuff. You know exactly where it's coming from. So people get so weirded out by like the raw milk thing, hmm. but it's the same exact thing. Yeah, it's, it's essentially like buying local beef. It's, it's like no different uh, than buying, you know, Walmart, milk versus like raw milk from like a farm in your town so i don't know 
tangent there. Yeah, but. no, dude. I, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Dude, but really, like, food's poison. Yeah. Like, specifically in America right now. It's wild what the food industry is doing. Yeah. And... So, yeah, I mean, like, I think the raw milk thing, whatever helps in, to make it not poison and to make it not about just having uh, these conglomerates control the food industry and to mass produce and put freaking industrial th- products into the food that we eat every day. Yeah. Uh, anything that can prevent that from happening is a good thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably that's why I support frank's and yeah. I, I buy raw milk and we, wanna... we appreciate it baby yeah <laughs> i mean Bree and i we go to the, the farmer's market every week in austin and like we'll buy vegetables and like as much as we can there yeah. because like again the shit you buy in the store is less quality and you're supporting like just these big corporations that aren't really in your best interest so i'm all for it but um i would so the go back to like the you're talking about how they like kind of specifically breed cows to be more efficient higher yield Mm -hmm. uh would that fall under like gmo at all see that's like a very good question right so that's a sort of a debate right so like what um genetically modified uh what does that even mean nowadays right like the definition of that uh i feel like is a lot more loose than ever um in my opinion, what GMOs are in a lab created specifically turning on and turning off different alleles in the DNA to make a, a specific sort of reaction happen. Um, <clears throat> that would probably be under my definition of what a GMO is. And so in order for that to uh, happen in beef, I don't necessarily think that's the same thing. When you're trying to breed and have it naturally for, uh, I mean, you just have the data in front of you. So I think that's a little different comparatively to, um, uh, it, it, I would, I would argue it's more like dogs. Okay. Like selective breeding. Yeah, exactly. It's more of like selective breeding comparatively to genetically modified because yeah. we're not modifying any genes. What we're doing is incorporating, uh, I mean, we're incorporating different genes with, uh, lineage comparatively to going into a lab and changing it specifically in the, uh, DNA. Does that make that sense? Makes sense? Yeah. It's more, it's more. And so that's going back to that. Like that's why these ranches that have been around for like four or five generations are so much better. Right. Mm-hmm. Because they've been doing that for four or five generations now and not all of them. Right. But like, that's the principle of it. And that's why, um, yeah. Like if you, the lineage is so important on, uh, breeds and everything. Cause you can't get a great ribeye without great genes and a great feed program and all the things have to be in place in order for the animal's life in order to uh be happy be healthy and grow appropriately so how did you guys go from actually before i answer that or before i ask that um actually i think i asked oh organic i'm really curious Mm. about organic yeah so that's like i'm pretty controversial on organic (laughs) dude i want to hear it i think it is uh, okay that being said Organic is a good thing in the sense of the intention, intentionality behind it, right? Uh, to get products that are not uh, got pesticides, herbicides, all that stuff, it, I think is a good thing. That being said, the way that is implemented in specifically the United States is a scam. Uh, I think it is a money grab that is all about... Um, yeah, it's a, once again, it's a system. So let's talk about how you get certified organic, okay? So I am a rancher, okay? I have a crop and I have a steer. If I don't buy organic certified seeds, if I just, my natural pasture that I have, um, it can, like, I have to specifically go rip that up and buy organically certified seeds to put in the ground. With the term organic on the seed, Ergo makes what? the price of the seed go higher, right? Uh, because of the of the certification process. So there is a certification process that happens every year on a lot of, specifically the GAP program is what it's called. Um, Whole Foods uh, created the GAP program, and so they are. That is, it's one of the most um, stringent. Uh, processes in order to be a part of it's pretty insane like the only gap program i even know of is uh in jackson this billionaire has a hundred million dollar ranch and so the way that they process the the way that the animals are raised and they sell it at the whole foods in jackson is within like 10 miles of it oh wow. yeah so it is actually i mean cool yeah. but we can't do that yeah. you know <laughs> you know what i mean we're not i can't we can't afford a 
in a ranch outside right in the middle of Jackson yeah. practically <laughs> like are you kidding me but anyway uh so yeah it just is uh yeah, the certification process is a little corrupt. It's just kind of a money grab. So you have to pay third-party companies in order to come in to make sure all this thing happens. And so they're getting paid from it. And then they, you have to pay a fee to the organic and get your st stuff stamped. And then on top of that, all your paperwork and due diligence, which also costs a lot more money, uh, has to be submitted to the USDA. And then the USDA has to look at it. And then there's money exchanged in that transaction. So Holy it's, shit. I don't know, it's... It's like I said, the intention of it is very good. Uh, the way that it is actually incorporated into the world, I think, is very poor. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, like, we, um, yeah, like, so technically we are not organic because we are not certified organic, uh, even though, and that has a lot to do with uh, our uh, feed producers and the way that they're not going to pay for the extra certifications on everything in order to, uh, because they can't afford it. Uh, not necessarily can't afford it, that's not the right term, but um, in order for them to operate in the way that we do, specifically in Wyoming, we're, they, the way that they have to buy raw materials isn't necessarily um, because we're in Wyoming. We're not in Nebraska. We're a lot higher here. So our yields on everything are a lot poorer. Mm. And so the way in which <clears throat> they grow the crops and everything wouldn't necessarily ca be categorized as organic. The market just isn't quite here for that. Does that, does that yeah, kind of make sense? sense? Yeah. Damn. Yeah. So I don't know. I think, I think it's good and the intentionality behind it, but, it, and that's just the meat industry, man. I can't even imagine like the organic on, I mean, anything else like, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, like and fruits so, and vegetables, uh, it's gotta be tough because so much of that's imported too. So it's, oh, yeah. it all comes from like overseas. Yeah. There's no regulation on it. So once again, I have to have my USDA guy be there all the time when I cut or dispatch any sort of animals. They can just import it and it's good. That's crazy. Yeah. So do you think there's a time and place for organic or is it like, yeah, what do you think it, like, I, people I, should pay attention to? I don't know. I, yeah. Organic that means that GMO thing too. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, specifically with, like fruits and vegetables, I probably would say it's a little bit better, right? Um, no herbicides, pesticides, anything like that. They can't use any sort of, uh, it has to be an all natural fertilizer or a certified organic fertilizer of some kind. And then um, uh, I think that's good. With beef, um, I th once again, going back to intentionality, I think it's so important just to know where it comes from. Yeah. If, if you know where it comes from. And then that's, I mean, that's why that term was, in my opinion, invented to, give people a sense of feeling of like, Oh, it's organic. So I don't know where it comes from still, but it's probably good. Right. Yeah. And so that, I mean, yeah. sure. But, uh, once again, I think getting closer to the source of like where your beef comes from and where your food actually comes from is probably a little bit more important. Yeah. 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 Dude, even like, I don't even like eating meat out anymore because I've been like eating either like Frank's oh, or like know, we buy man. stuff in Austin from like a local farm or something. And it's like, I know exactly where it's coming from. And then like, we go to like, we ate out this morning for breakfast and I had a steak and I was like, who the hell knows where the steak is coming from? <laughs> well, that's like, just, it, the flavor of it, dude. Like, I, yeah. I feel like I cook a steak so good that yeah. like when I go and get a steak at a restaurant, I'm just like, oh, like I didn't have to cook it, but yeah. I'm not very satisfied with the product that I'm getting, man. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah, I know. I, I, I'm sorry. I ruined that for you. Yeah, uh, you really did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If it makes you feel any better, I'm, I'm the same way. So yeah, that's yeah nice. it's a, I mean, I feel like if anybody is listening to this, cares about like the, the quality of the food, the nutrients, uh, where it's coming from, if you care about the, the environment, like mm -hmm. obviously like just supporting, I mean, it goes for all businesses, like supporting a local small business is so much better. And the cool thing again with Frank's is like, yes, you're small and local, but you can ship literally anywhere, anywhere in the country, oh, which I think is so yeah. cool. Yeah, hundred <clears throat> percent. Yeah. And we have our, uh, uh, our full catalog is online too. So, yeah. um, a lot of people that ship are pretty limited or you always get on like the online stuff and it always says sold out or something like that. And so, like I said, the way that we're growing, we've, um, incorporated that pretty well. So hopefully we'll never have to put like sold out on anything. Yeah. I feel like usually you guys are pretty good <clears throat> with, with not having to do that. It seems oh yeah. Like yeah. No, we, uh, yeah, I mean, if we got it. We'll ship it, baby. Again, you know, <laughs> or uh, yeah, and so yeah, it's just I think it's uh, it's solid right now. Heck yeah, yeah for sure. What uh, what are your favorite cuts of meat? Ah, oh, dude, loaded question. But uh, <laughs> so I probably, probably got two. So uh, I'm a ribeye guy. 
So I like the fat, I like flavor. I like the spinalis muscle, which is the cap of the ribeye. That one obviously is just fantastic. That's like but, that thin part around the outside. Yeah. So you got your little eye on your ribeye and then the little thing that goes on top of it, that's mm. the cap. And so like, uh, when you're picking ribeyes, little tip, pick ones with better caps because okay. it's the most tender and flavorful part mm. of the ribeye. And so, uh, and you're paying the same price for it. So you might as well get a cap, right? Right. I never uh, knew that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we sell just caps too. cap steaks. Oh. Yeah. So those are like really popular. Uh, if you go to like Vegas or, uh, you see them on menus and stuff like that, uh, across the country and like a little higher end restaurants and stuff like that. But, uh, that obviously, those two are obviously that's like the Rolls Royce part, right? Like that's so good. But like just general every day is this flat iron, dude, dude the flat irons are nuts. <laughs> they, uh, it's a, it's a under the scapula. And so you get two of them on a half of beef and they're like kind of a thin little, you know, about that long, kind of about that thick, uh, Cut. That's all you get out of an entire cow. Yeah, you get two of those. Yeah. Whoa. Well, two on a half, so you get four of those. Okay. Uh, because everything in butchering is like per half of the beef. But okay. anyway, uh, so yeah, you get four of steaks on the whole beef, and then they're just nuts. You have mistakes, you can marinate them. The marbling inside of them is awesome. Uh, you can put them on uh you can do literally anything with them. They're yeah. insane. They're and so good. I also really like skirt steaks too. Skirt mm. steaks, just the way that they uh yeah, the flavor profile of a skirt steak because, like, a skirt steak uh, comes from the abdominal region. So it, mm. yeah, so it actually holds the diaphragm, and so you take that muscle out. So the way it metabolizes fat right there, comparatively to the way it metabolizes in like a muscle group on your back, which is where the ribeye would be, uh, completely different flavor profile and flavor experience. And I think it's even a little bit more superior uh, than. Uh, like the, the way the fat tastes comparatively to a ribeye and stuff like that. And so, yeah, the skirt steak's nuts. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. And that just kind of goes with all the meats and stuff. So like, depending on where it is on the animal's anatomy, then makes it taste a lot different too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Dang. Not to get too woo woo, but I always wonder if like, I feel like if you're eating like factory farmed meat, those animals are like stressed out. Mm-hmm. they're not happy it's not their natural environment and then you eat that like again this is probably not backed by science or anything but like i feel like that translates over into the food and then you consume it and you're getting this like weird oh it it's, it's a, like it doesn't it, feel right it's 100 percent backed by science it's really? like a real thing oh, yeah really? man like we're just trying to mitigate stress as much as possible like with stress animal doesn't grow animals stressed out they produce adrenaline and things like that. So let's talk, I, I'm a big hunter. So yeah. I hunt uh, and I archery hunt. So I, uh, for example, this last year, like this is my little anecdote. I don't know if there's way facts behind it, but so I, uh, shot my elk, with my bow, and I made like the cardinal mistake of, uh, not going up to it. So you're supposed to wait like 30 minutes or so before I go up to it. But I was so confident my shot went up to it. Like two minutes later, I watched the animal put its head down touch his eye and it was completely dispatched. Like, and so that we process that animal, let it dry age, of course. Right. And then, uh, it is the best tasting elk I've ever had in my entire life. Cause really? it, it's just, yeah, because it wasn't stressed out. It wasn't running. And, yeah. and the, so the similar pro, that's, a, we take all those into account when we are raising our cattle, when we're at our processing facility, even we do all the things to mitigate stress like, because it makes it taste better. You yeah. know, they don't have all this like, uh, like cortisol and adrenaline just built up in them that makes it not flavorful. That makes so much sense. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, I guess that was like my instinct, uh, but that makes perfect sense. I mean, if you got all those like chemicals and stuff running through there, it's like, I don't know. Like you, you take a human that's all stressed out all the time, like they're usually not in great physical shape because their just body is like tense and not mm-hmm. how it should be. But if you're just relaxed and like yeah I mean, not your, anxious your and, heart goes out if yeah you're way stressed right Literally. you know like say i mean why would uh animals be any different you know that makes perfect sense mm-hmm. dang uh last question uh ground beef is that like where does that come from i eat a shit ton of ground beef <laughs> yeah so uh that's a good question so there's a bunch of different grinds is what it's called <clears throat> so ground beef uh so when you're uh so the half of slab, right? The half of slab comes in on the hook and now we're breaking it down. So when I cut my uh, flat iron steak, when I cut my skirt steak, when I cut all these steaks, I'm trimming them up. And so the little pieces that are good pieces that aren't like the silver skin or anything like that, that are just like 
um, the actual meat and fat gets put into a pile. Okay, and then that pile is put through a grinder and ground with a specific ratio of fat in it. So oh. they take the fat from the beef as well, and then they blend it together based on weight. <clears throat> and so that's what ground beef is. So there's, a, yeah, ground beef. And so doing that from, and that's really what makes us a lot different with our grind, in my opinion, is because doing that from a dry aged beef comparatively to that wet age from the factory like we were talking about flavor profiles night and day yeah on it but then on top of that uh it's important to like see where your grinds come from so uh like <clears throat> if you're using just uh, ground chuck for example or ground like uh you really like uh what's that place in uh tex franklin's yeah i'm pretty sure or, uh, uh terry black's or terry Bla uh, yeah terry yeah. black's uh uh, I actually don't know if it's Terry Black's now. I don't want to quote. Franklin's but, the other big Yeah, one. yeah. So I think uh, they they do they grind their briskets and stuff. So they use specific cuts to grind. So briskets a popular one. Chuck's a popular one. We sell a ground chuck, mm -hmm. and so it would be only the chuck section, which is like the top shoulder ribeye, top of the ribeye area, and so uh, which produces a way different experience than all the cuts together, right? Because that flavor profile, comparatively, just the flavor profile of the chuck is way different based on the anatomy of the steer yeah. like we were just talking about. Does yeah. that make sense? hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Dude, the, when I, if I buy ground beef from like HEB in Texas or if I get it from like butcher box or something, it's like, it's more like greasy and like, mm -hmm. it doesn't, it's got like this weird taste and it just doesn't like it, it looks and tastes less quality. Like not, oh, for not sure. as good quality. Yeah. I mean, a lot of that has to do with the grind itself too. Yeah. So like going back to that fat ratio, uh, we are generally around like 90% of that pile and 10% fat. Um, uh, typically at the grocery stores, it's more like 80, 20 because they want to sell more volume, yeah. more money, more product and, <clears throat> or less product for the same amount of money. Right. It's like drug dealers, right? They cut it with <laughs> like whatever they want to cut. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Make it cheaper. But, yeah. uh, so yeah, it's, uh, but that being said, it does add, a di it's going back to the intentionality of everything. So ground yeah. chuck for a burger is way better than, um, not way better, but it's a different product than your regular ground beef because there's a lot more fat in the chuck mm. section comparatively to the night, the 10%. So when you want burgers, we're, we're around like, um, more of like an 85, 15, so that way it like has a better flavor profile to it because once again, fat's flavor and uh, it chars a little bit better mm -hmm. and the texture of it is a little bit better comparatively to. And so, yeah, like when you cook with 80% or 20% fat comparatively to 10% fat, what it looks like in your pan is night and day. Right. You know, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Damn. Dude, this is. This yeah. has been so informative. Yeah, dude. There's, yeah, there's, you know there's, so much about beef. There's so much, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's not really there's so much. It's just what is enlightening being in this industry and like just seeing all this stuff is. And that's our business model, man, is yeah. we just want to educate our folks about what uh, we do and then just about beef in general. That way, when they go and to the other grocery stores or they got, get any of the other products, they know and see and taste why ours is more of a superior product comparatively to theirs yeah. are. So, I mean, that's our whole sales tech tactic is essentially we're educating our customers as opposed to uh actually trying to sell you anything well like i don't even care if you don't buy franks i just want to know where your beef comes from yeah you know what i mean i want you to know that that way you're getting a reliable source and things like that i love that dude yeah. every person i've ever given a steak to or like they come over and like we make something for them Every time they're like, dude, this is the best steak I've ever had. It's yeah. just, there's something yeah. to it, man. Dude, I'm telling you, like, it is, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, we educate people all the time. Like, you know, like, you've been baptized, baby. Like, you can't go <laughs> yeah. back. Like, it's so good. It is, uh, yeah, it's just so night and day what you can get yeah. compared to a grocery store. Yeah. I love that. Dude, what's the, um, what's like the grand vision for Frank's? Like, if you had, a, I don't know, 10 years down the line, like, what's like the big North Star? Damn, that's a way good question. Uh, so, yeah, probably the next steps would be in order to expand would be in order to, like, maintain our – so going back to, like, I want to maintain our product without, you know, getting too mainstream – not main, mainstream, but, like, too diluted on what we're doing. So we would probably have to acquire more of, like, a – oh, more acquire a uh, – another farm and kind of getting more of the feedlot side of things where we can kind of control our products a little bit better. And that way we don't have to outsource all that stuff. Yeah. 
um, would probably be the next steps. And then, man, just build more of these, like kind of, um, like I said, we have two physical locations, uh, trying to maybe work on a third, uh, this time next year. And then, uh, yeah, just kind of go from there, man. I think, I, uh, I think it can be really good, man. I yeah. think it can really take off. It's the products there, the, um, kind of the models there and it's so far so good. So, you know, to the moon. Heck yeah. Frank's mm -hmm. to the moon, baby. Yeah. I love it. Hell yeah. Uh, if anybody wants to uh, reach out to you personally or if they want to order Frank's, how does anybody yeah, go about so that? Yeah, so franksbootshop.com. Uh, you can order all your products there. Um, we have like social media. It's uh, Frank's Butcher Shop. Uh, make sure to do that one. We have like the physical location. So it says Casper and Hudson at the other ones and things like that. So uh, yeah, you can follow us on social media. You can... I run all that so you can just message us on there and i'll be reaching out to you yeah beautiful mm -hmm. thanks for coming on dude this yeah. is fun yeah way fun thank you for having Heck me yeah. dad thanks bryce all right we'll see you later everybody peace thank you so much for tuning into the show if you enjoyed this episode please make sure to subscribe to the channel leave a review and share it with a friend we'll see you in the next one <laughs>